Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our UB Research Essential Series 2. I hope you all are doing well and staying safe at home. So once again, uh, we are glad to run this session today. Today's session is on managing research data and documentation. This session will be facilitated by Ms. Virginia Balance. Um, as you are aware, uh, this is a series of uh, sessions that we've been having this whole semester. Uh, so we have two more sessions before we end for the fall semester. So today's session uh, is to look at the integral part of the research process. So this is key when you are carrying out good research. So the session today will certainly focus on uh, the fundamental research data management practices needed to develop a data management plan. So Ms. Balance will take you through uh, step by step on your understanding on the understanding of how do you manage your data and documentation efficiently because this will also uh, result in producing good high impact research which is what we are going to be focusing on in our next session on the 27th of November. So uh, uh, just uh, uh, standard housekeeping, please be informed the session is being recorded. All your microphone have been muted except uh, for the co-host, uh, Ms. Balance. Uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, you can raise your question by using your E uh, raise hand option or even put in the chat as Ms. Balance is presenting, you can continuously put in your question in the chat and we will take the question at the end of the session. So now I shall hand over the session to Ms. Balance to share her screen for the session today. Ms. Balance? Yes, so, sorry, I was too busy trying to click and share my screen. I forgot to unmute. There we go. All right. Okay. Um, I thought long and hard about how to introduce this topic because um, usually when you think about research, you come up with a study instrument, a survey, you collect data, you analyze it, you write your paper, it gets published, end of story. So what do you do with all the data that you collected? I know personally, I've got a couple boxes of data in my office. I know that some people have data on a jump drive somewhere. So the data after you do your study just sits idle. But these days, technological advances in the creation of data in electronic or digital format uh, with a new means of storage and then internet communication means that your data is now a key part of your scholarly record. It's not just the article that you publish or the book or the chapter. It's the data itself becomes a part of the scholarly record because it can exist in a format that can be shared relatively easily. So as Dr. Vick said, this session will be a very brief introduction to research data management. Uh, what it is, why it is important, uh, why have a research data ma management plan, and what are the components of that plan, particularly regarding documentation, file organization, file storage, and data documentation. And I'll address how to address uh, some of the issues um, that you have to address when preparing your data set for long-term preservation for access and sharing by others. But to start off with, what is research data? That might seem a, a very basic question. Don't just think of it as numbers. Your research data can be anything. It can be any information that you have collected observed, generated, or created via a survey, questionnaire, lab, lab or observations, photographs, audio, video. It's generally these days, it's um, 
in digital format. Um, some data can exist in two formats, like lab note in uh, non-digital formats, like uh, lab notebooks, diaries, and so on. And some data can actually exist in two formats. Like think about music. It could be a sound recording or it could be a musical score that's written down. So in sum, research data is any recorded factual data collected for analysis. And, and what is um, research data management? Research data management is not only important uh, when you're conducting research for a PhD or for a large scale government grant, but it's even useful for uh, research projects at, conducted by undergraduate students. It's good to get into the habit of thinking about aspects of research data management um, for your study, because you will establish good research management skills that are gonna be useful throughout your academic career. Uh, for an example, someone doing a 400 level nursing research course may think their topic is good enough to continue when they move on to do a master's degree. So research data management is a general term about organizing, structuring uh, your data in such a way that it can be used for the long term. Um, so, and it should be done uh, at the beginning of your project. Uh, it focuses you to think through all aspects of your data collection, organization, and storage before you even uh, start administering the first questionnaire. But why manage it? Why bother? If there are many benefits. Um, if you have a good plan, for managing your data, you can spend more time on the research. Uh, organized data will be easier for you to find uh, when you need to. You won't be uh, sifting through folders on the computer or on your desktop. Um, I'm like, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, and there, they will be, you will prevent, uh, you won't have duplication of effort uh, trying to collect data again because you messed up with uh, how you organized it. Um, organized files prevent uh, data loss and they're easier to track progress and versions of data and reports. Um, they're less likely to get lost. Uh, when everybody involved in your project knows what they're supposed to be doing when collecting and there's no need to go back to recollect or rework data because you can find them easily um, and also in some cases you may have to come to show your data uh, if there's a query or a request from another researcher for freedom of information uh, intellectual property rights and so on but a big issue in um, science, particularly, is the replicability and reproducibility of your results. These days, many journals require that your data be submitted along with the journal manuscript so that your results can be checked by other researchers. APA journals uh, require that your data be available for five years. Um, grant and funding agencies, particular grant funders, require that your data be made available also because like open access publishing uh, that was funded by the government it needs to be made accessible to the public freely accessible um, in the u.s the national science foundation and the national institutes for health require that your data be deposited in an open data repository um, and you can see here this is something i picked off of the elsevier uh, journal website for uh, submission they require that your data be deposited um, for many reasons, transparency, accountability, and to prevent academic fraud. Other good reasons for managing your data 
are that it will benefit the scientific community. Um, other uh, researchers in your field can uh, share your data, look at the data for verification. If your data is open um, and available, it gives you more credibility because the data itself can be cited, not just the article you wrote about your data, and that will increase the impact and visibility of your research. And in sum, the data that you collect in a research project, either for a term paper, a PhD, or a large funded government research project, is in itself a valuable resource because it takes a lot of time and expense to collect the data. And if it's properly documented, um, others can, uh, will avoid having to, to duplicate the data collection to do a similar topic. They can, they can use your data. And another point is that a well-documented data set can be used for education and training. And an example of that is like the, the LAPOP, the Latin American Public Com Opinion Project data that, that is freely available and can be uh, downloaded and reused. And we've used it a lot in our research in the Bahamas. And in my uh, research to prepare for this, I discovered the US government maintains nearly five dozen scientific data sets about the Bahamas, mostly about natural science, about blue holes and, and uh, marine resources. So it's uh, important to document your data so that others can use it. Now that we realize that managing data is important and sometimes required, how do you go about it? You write a data management, research data management plan. And you do this at the beginning of your project before you even submit your survey to the to your uh, your population um, the data management plan will force you to think through all aspects of the data management process um, it's a document quite simply uh, um, it can be as little as two pages one or two pages and it describes how you will manage the data that you're going to collect, generate, or, and analyze through out your research project, both during and after. It's not a static dom document. In other words, it's not engraved in stone. You can um, update it as needed. Um, not all data management plans are the same and have, some have other com different components. Some are very detailed, others are very, very limited. Um, it can be a formal document that a um, research funder uh, or agency or, the, or your university may require, and in which case they may have a specific format for you to follow. Um, and, or it could be a very informal document that you create at the beginning of your research project to keep your team on track. Um, there is no one set format. Um, they all have, but there are some common features. So the next stage in this presentation, it's very fast, I know, um, is to look at some of the components of a data management plan. Um, it, as I say, it describes what data will be collected, uh, whether you, you collect it yourself or use a data set that exists. Um, how it will be described in uh, how the files are organized and in what file formats. Um, it outlines how you will store your files and make them accessible, how you will um, document the data. Uh, it will address some aspect of data security, data sharing, i.e. who will have access um, in the long run as well as ethical, intellectual property, uh, roles, responsibilities, budgeting issues. So I'm gonna uh, move through each of these components of a data management plan. 
the data description, the first component, describe the data, whether it's data that you've collected or are reusing. Um, Describe the types of data that you're going to use. Is it numeric, textual, audio, visual, and where, how you uh, acquired it? Where it's, what is its source? Was it from an experiment, observation? Uh, is it raw data, derived data from a simulation, et cetera? And you also need to have an idea about the amount of data that you're going to acquire for storage purposes. Once you have the data, you should uh, ad address how it will be processed, what software um, you're going to be using um, to make sure you use the right software. And finally, uh, address issues of quality assurance and control measures, how to identify potentially incorrect data, how you're gonna deal with it, how to check, flag, or fix the data as you input it into Excel or SPSS. So look out for coding errors when you transfer your data into a, a spreadsheet. File formats um, also need to be thought about. Uh, you need to describe the formats you plan to use to store your data and your documentation. It's a good practice to use um, standard formats such as TXT files. Um, of course, uh, DOC and XLS files from Microsoft are widely used and will probably not become obsolete, but it's usually good practice to use um, universal um, formats so that if you have to move from one uh, platform to another, the data will transfer easily. Um, also note that in specific fields, in science, there may be standards that are commonly used. In addition, you need to think about and plan for file naming conventions or schemes for your data sets, files, and folders. And if you do this at the beginning, this will allow you to work efficiently um, and allow your, you and your team to easily identify, locate, and use particularly if you have large amounts of data. Um, and perhaps most important is for version control to prevent confusion uh, about which version of the data we work, data set we're working on today. Um, this is often a big problem on, in research teams that you, no, people aren't sure which uh, version of the, the data you're working on or which version of the document you're working on. So this provo uh, prevents confusion, also data loss. So files and folders should be structured in a hierarchical, hierarchical structure. Um, and by determining this ahead of time means that you're less likely to have to go back and reorganize your files during the project. Um, a file name is the chief identifier of your data set and it has to make sense to you and your team. So ideas on how to structure a naming scheme would be the project name, the date, the content, the team members ID, version number, and finally dot file type. Um, a few pointers about uh, file organization and naming schemes that, is that they have to be consistent. Um, throughout your project file, data files. Um, they say something between 25 and 32 characters um, is the max. Um, and use your elements consistently. So if you abbreviate the project name, abbreviate it consistently throughout all the files. Use a standard data format. And you can see here on this slide, it's year, 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 month, month, day, day. Um, there are so many different versions of whether it's day, month, year, month, day, year, et cetera. If you use the standard format that is consistent across all your files, it will be very much easier for you. Do not use uncommon characters like the 
uh, question mark, ampersand, etc. cetera. Um, sometimes those actually mess up different uh, files. They're un unable, the computers are unable to read them um, and they're a bit confusing. And do not use spaces in file names, but use an underscore. And this is particularly important when you're sharing files. Um, as for file storage and backup, uh, you have to have a good data storage and backup strategy to protect against accidental or malicious data loss. And these can be anything from natural disasters, infrastructure failure, storage failure, software failure, format obsolescence, human error, a server attack. I mean, there can be anything. It's quite scary. And I read something about a data, unbacked up data lives two months shorter than the time of your PhD. So if you didn't back it up, you might be in a big problem in the middle of your uh, dissertation, uh, uh, analyzing your data for your dissertation. So it's uh, suggested to have three copies of your data, two on different types of storage data media, so two, um, two copies, one on a computer, one on an external drive, and one off-site. And where possible, use non-proprietary formats and develop a regular backup routine, which is then um, synchronized amongst all your backup copies and date them. And it's usually a good idea to create digital copies of your analog materials, just in case there's a fire and you lose all your notes. Where to store your data? You have lots of options. Um, laptops, of course, are convenient, portable, available, but they could be stolen. So always have a secure backup of the data on your laptop. Uh, you can store uh, data on an external drive, which is portable, easy, but they also can be easily lost or damaged. Um, a good option is to use network drives managed by the institution because they're backed up on a regular basis and accessible from wherever you are, or to use cloud storage, um, which is also useful for internet access. It's not recommended to use web-based storage platforms such as Google Drive or, Doc or Dropbox. Data documentation or metadata, which is basically data about data. How you describe the data. You need to describe and document your data. Um, uh, they can be done two ways. Uh, metadata is data about data. It can be done through readme files or a data dictionary in TXT format. Um, and this is a file which just defines the terms, your codes, uh, acronyms, units of measurement that you may be using, uh, naming schema, schema for files, and so on. Metadata is basically structured uh, in a way that can be machine readable. So it's probably in a machine readable format such as XML. And you need to have uh, your metadata in machine readable form if you're going to deposit it. And typically, uh, it, once you choose a depository, repository, they'll tell you what metadata format is required and what elements are required. So the next two slides are, um, I'm going to show you uh, some of the elements that you might use to describe your data. Um, the title of your project, who's involved, an abstract or summary, uh, the time period, uh, instrumentation used, what access rights you have, hardware, software use. And I should reiterate that not every data set has all these elements. 
So the next two slides will uh, show you an abbreviated example of a README uh, data documentation file. It's, this is not in XML. Um, in this case, you see it's got the data file name and, a, and it's using a, a year underscore and the, uh, an acronym for the project and what the file is. It's an inventory and it's in TXT file uh, type file. It describes the data file description, the format, um, who the, you give who the PI is or who owns the data, name and their contacts, any in associated investigators, and the data collection dates. And again, you see it's in year, 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 month, month, day, day format. Um, there's a section to describe the methodology in detail and sharing and access information. So this is a very simple uh, example of, uh, of metadata about for a project. Um, if you don't intend to submit your data to a repository, it's still important to uh, to write up uh, to document your data. But if you do intend to uh, publish your, a paper about your research, um, your data actually may be useful for the long term for other people. Um, so you need to think about what, what part of the data set that you've created should be preserved and where it will be archived. Um, not all your data needs to be preserved. Um, and then for where it will be archived, find the most appropriate one. Um, you would know for your scientific community uh, what the most important one would be to de deposit your data to. Um, and then there are some uh, general uh, data uh, repositories that are free that we can also use. And then you need to also think about how you, what you have to do to prepare your data for deposit. Um, that might be reformatting, making sure the metadata is in the right uh, format. And then you have to decide who's going to be responsible for that data in the long run. And it's surprising always that you think your data isn't important and someone will come back and ask you about it years and years later. We see that particularly with a project we did in 2005 at the university about um, a study of the Haitian population in the Bahamas and the data is still being requested 15 years later. Um, sharing and reuse of your data is a, an important part of your data management plan. Uh, you need to address the policies that you would like to have for uh, sharing. Now you may have an obligation to share the data from the funding agency or from your university, or um, when you are publishing in a journal, they may require you to uh, attach the, your data. Um, and you need to briefly outline details about sharing your data. How long after you collect it will it be available? How can it be accessed? And does your, the researcher have exclusive rights for a period of time. Um, an example I saw um, on a journal page uh, yesterday e explains how the, the data is a limited data set has been deposited to Zenobo and the DOI assigned is whatever or the URL. And so th that's an example that we're going to see more and more these days where data has to be deposited along with uh, when a journal article is published. The last few issues regarding your data set are uh, ethical and intellectual property issues. Um, you need to address how those are going to be managed, particularly if you collect sensitive data uh, about uh, human subjects. Um, the data needs to be de-identified or anonymized so that um, people can't track it back to particular people. Um, also questions of IP, intellectual property and copyright issues, who owns the data, 
if you did the research through your university, um, who owns it, do you own it, for how long, or does the university own the data? Um, who is responsible for the data? Generally, the um, principal investigator is responsible. Um, if that person leaves the university or the project, who is going to step in? And is there a department in your university or your institution that would take proxy control if uh, for the long run? And last but always, the budget. Um, in your data management plan, you need to think about money, obviously. Uh, you need to consider costs that you will incur with collecting, managing, storing, analyzing, uh, and preserving your data. And this can all be worked into the grant. So in sum, um, okay, uh, tools that you can use for uh, creating your data management plan. There are two tools that are uh, free. Uh, dmptool.org uh, from California and the DMP online, which is a British um, tool. So in sum, data management plans ensure that it's a document that ensures that your data are well organized, documented, accurate, stored, backed up and preserved and accessible. You do this at the beginning of your project, it saves time, it results in no lost data, makes your data easier to find, share and understand by your team members in the short run and long run by other people, other researchers. And by having a plan, you get to spend more time on analysis and not managing your data. So there are loads of tutorials and resources about data management. I've listed some here. And I thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Balance, for uh, giving us a good understanding of managing data and documentation, which we, we normally don't really talk so much about, but which is very essential. Um, I've opened the floor for any questions. Um, I see this one comment here, uh, which, is, which was also one of my questions that I wanted to ask. Uh, you, you did mention in your presentation that Dropbox or Google Drive is not appropriate for storage. Why? Um, not for long-term storage because they don't adhere to standards and they're not, um, they're not uh, subject specific. Okay. So if you look at Dropbox and Google Drive and a lot of the other uh, uh, share uh, uh, applications where you can actually save uh, a lot of mm -hmm. data. I think what is critical uh, is you must always have a backup of whatever that you have stored in this cloud. Because I have experienced myself where I've lost huge amount of uh, data set that was stored in Dropbox and uh, and they tried to recover the file, but there was something that went wrong and uh, the whole thing disappeared. And uh, <gasps> there's a recovery way to actually extract. So they managed to extract part of the data, but a lot of it was lost uh, in Dropbox. So ever since then, I stopped using Dropbox. I moved to Google Drive, which I found it a bit more secure. But having said all that, whatever backup that you do on top of your um, cloud storage, please make sure that you have another backup as what uh, Ms. Balance have mentioned. You should have at least three. Two, uh, in, uh, in, in, it can be the same media, maybe one in cloud and one uh, uh, within your laptop and then you need to have another one externally, but that external should not be within the same location. It should be ex kept elsewhere. I normally have a backup in my office and the same backup I have it at home. So, so in case if anything goes wrong, I have two versions in two different locations and I have one version in the cloud. So I normally work on three. So uh, this is important because you don't know how important it is until you have lost this data. Then you realize, oh God, 
I, I did not take the trouble to back up because you find that, oh, doing this backup takes a lot of time. And, but when you lose the file, then you regret it. So be very careful, especially for those of you who are working on research projects, working on your dissertation, do not uh, take for granted because I have seen students crying, losing data, hard earned, uh, hard working data, everything lost because they did not put the trouble in managing their data uh, efficiently. And now if you look at a lot of the publications, uh, they require this data. Not all, but many of these publications now require you to keep this data uh, for at least five years and some five years, some more than that, depending on the publication, depending on the, on the some funding bodies, they also require that. So whatever data, whether it is a, when you, when you say your, your research data, as I've, I've put in the chat, digital or non-digital data, but it must be recorded in a form that can be retrieved. So even if it is non-digital, you can digitalize non-digital data and there must be an, a way that you can actually retrieve it when you want it. So if you have all this data, but then you're not able to find or retrieve it, then it's as, it's as good as useless. So you must have a proper management of this data where you are able to locate the data uh, when you want it. So this is very important. Um, uh, data sets can be kept in websites, can be kept in, in, any, in any other areas that you want, but it's always good to link the data set to a particular publication. Let's say if you're publishing something, try to link that publication to a set of data, the data sets that is actually coming out of this publication. So you, that can be a hyperlink that's linking it back to this uh, data set. So that is how we can actually share data. So this is, this is how you make use of uh, all this data. Um, okay, there's a question from Dr. Gangelhoff. Any suggestion for storage for large files such as audio and video files? I find they take up so much storage and it gets expensive buying so many backup drives or cloud storage. Oh boy, I think that's why having an idea of the amount of storage you have um, and that you build it into your grant to uh, actually purchase uh, a, a, you, there are uh, commercial data storage uh, companies um, or try to find a, an appropriate um, data bank. You know, I saw that the Smithsonian, for instance, uh, has, uh, does data storage. And so if, if you, if your data set matches something which a particular uh, institution's uh, um, reason for being, then you could maybe make a case to deposit your data there and that they would take care of it for you. Yeah, it's, it's always a challenge, uh, especially uh, yeah. audio and, and video files. Because yeah, they're all, so big. Yeah, because it's too big and whatever uh, storage that you have there may not be sufficient and, and you will burst the the limit so fast and you will end up paying a significant amount to keep it uh, over there. So it, it, it is a challenge and uh, so a lot of audio, of course, if you are working on a lot of the audio and video, uh, preferably you should have a, an in-house good uh, server that holds all this in addition to the ba backup that you can actually uh, have. Because I know in my previous institution uh, where they, they run, uh, uh, they do the whole lot of uh, audio and video files, there is a, a server purchased at the university where it keeps a backup of all those video and audio. And, and then they have a mechanism to, to do this backing up of the server. If in case a server fail, then how it backs up to the other server. So these are audio and video files that is uh, developed by faculty and used by the university. So, uh, so that is, uh, you're talking about physical server, but then uh, when you talk about uh, cloud, the problem is always uh, cloud storage may not be sufficient for all the audio and video unless there are vendors uh, who is doing that uh, in a professional way where you pay them and then they are able to store these files. 
uh, there's a question from uh, Lesfi here. I considered saving my data as files on EndNote. What are the pros and cons of that? Um, EndNote uh, is a proprietary software and that you would have to keep buying new versions and it may not stay the same from version to version. Um, that's, <laughs> uh, unless you, but you, you'd have to make sure you save it on two places, mm. not just one. I don't know if I answered that well enough. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not too sure as well whether, uh, how, how safe is this uh, saving all the data uh, using EndNote. Uh, I think even if, even if you use an EndNote, you still need to have uh, another backup of the files that is being uh, saved through EndNote. So it's not just EndNote, I think whichever application that you're talking about. Um, another question here, when managing your data, how do you identify which files go together in a specific file location and which data is relevant. I often mix the wrong files in the same folder. I guess that one is, um, that's hard because it's like baseball, you call it as you see it. Um, but you should probably keep project files together, data files together, um, other kinds of document, together in a different in another file but is but by sitting down and thinking it through of the kinds of things you're going to collect yeah. um, you can sort of sort them out at the beginning and then just use it consistently so once you have it clear in your head what goes in what folder yeah what kind of files go in which folder and that's why if you document it then you can always go back to your document, your readme file, your data documentation file, and remind yourself, oh no, this is an interview transcript. It goes here. Yeah. So you have, you've set up your rules in the beginning so you won't uh, have that kind of mix up. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with, I suppose, as, if the project evolves and you, and you find it makes more sense to move them to a different place, yeah. then you just adjust your your description okay yeah so uh, this file management is, I mean it's very critical uh, as what Ms. Balance say right from the beginning so normally whenever I work on any any projects I think you'll have one of course you will need you will put it all in one folder but within the folder then you start breaking down what should what are the data that you're going to be collecting in this uh, particular project what are the documents, uh, what are the images, uh, what are the data sets that's going to come out, the primary data, secondary data. So you got to create a, a subfolders and within the file subfolders, what is more important is the naming of the files. Because if you don't name the files correctly, it's going to be a challenge. Another habit that you, you need to do, which takes more time is whenever you create any files, always fill up the properties column of the file. Most people don't do, they save the file, save the seed. They don't go to the properties and put in more information. So when, whenever you click, right click and you look at properties and you can fill up the details, the file name, what is this file about? You can put the author's name. You want some keywords there. You can tag it. Why is it good to put that? In case you're lost because you have so much of data, you can still search and locate the file because you have tagged it correctly. But if you don't tag it, if your file naming is not correct, or if your folder is not correct, you will never find the files. You'll be lost in the thousands and millions of files that you have, that you've collected over the last many years. Yes, that's a very good point, Vic. And I'm, I, I actually was going to talk, mention that, but I thought in the, for the essence of time, but yes, indeed. Underneath any file that you create, whether Word, Excel, PDF, there is data that's created, it's metadata, it's data about the document or the file, the data. And you, it's, it's just describing it and you put whatever information you want. And like Vic says, a lot of keywords that will remind you what the file is about. And then those things are all searchable. 
on your computer. It's fantastic. Another question, do you know specifically how to download data stored on NVivo? I mean, is it possible to save it from NVivo? Seems like I have always have to go to NVivo to access it. Yes, you can. There is a function on NVivo. I just looked it up. I, I won't lie. <laughs> you can actually export your data from NVivo and put it into Excel or whatever format you want. Yeah. You just have to uh, dig around a bit. I'm not, I don't know NVivo, but I looked up can, how to export data from NVivo and it says you do. You use an export. There's an export feature. There's on most of these uh, data management um, products, there's an export function. Yes. I think uh, NVivo is not just NVivo, even if you look at the, the quantitative uh, applications like uh, SPSS or SAS, they all have this export feature where you can export it uh, into any other form uh, uh, of any other applications that are similar. So SPSS can be exported easily to Excel and then you can use Excel to actually open the, the data set. Similarly, uh, I'm sure and we will have that function as well where you can export it and open it in, in any other applications. And I think this is a case where your metadata, how you describe the data in NVivo uh, for export has to match field by field so that your data doesn't end up in the wrong place. Yeah. And then you spend hours and hours cleaning it and organizing it correctly for the new application. That's just a thought. Great. Um, any more questions? Feel free to uh, even raise your hand and, and I, I can unmute you if you want to directly uh, ask question or you can even put it in the chat. We will make uh, this recording accessible for everyone, um, including the, the presentation today. As long as you have registered, you will get access to, to the files as always. Okay, and um, I will um, also create a library guide about this topic. Okay, great. So that will be on the libguides on, on the internet and it will just go through this thing that's uh, step by step and what needs to be, you know, what the essentials. Mm -hmm. And of course, I should also say, um, all along in this process, you can interact with the librarian for assistance uh, on any point of the process that um, we're well, well poised to assist um, with uh, documentation, uh, looking for um, a repository, any kinds of issues you have with whatever. With uh, that, that's what we do these days. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I see a message from uh, Lasfi here. I think this is meant for Camille. Uh, uh, this is on this application, Catma. I've never used it before. Uh, this is a free qualitative management software, Catma, which is similar to NVivo. Uh, I have a concern that because it's an open source, that my interview data is not protected. I tried researching the terms of agreement to find out, but I could not find anything. Is there any open, open source software that has a security feature to protect my data? I'm not sure, too, too sure about that. Uh, Ms. Balance, are you aware? Um, I'm, I'm not familiar with the software. I would expect um, there must be some kind of a control. The, the software is open source. Your data isn't open source. So it's only allow it's allowing you to use the software, but it doesn't mean that your that your data is free, yeah, not protected. So it's so only the, about yeah. So the data is, will still be protected. I yeah, suppose. it's only the the application is open source. Yeah. All right. Any more? Last call. We are at 2.49, five minutes past the time. Okay, so if there's no more question, 
please feel free. If you have any further question, do not hesitate to, to contact us. You can email to us uh, anytime. Um, okay, okay, there's another message here. Uh, can you give me the names of other free qualitative software? Free qualitative software. Is there any other free oh. qualitative beside CADMA? Oh dear. <laughs> Um, I'll get back to you. Yeah, we, we, we will, we will try to, to, to get back to you on that. I don't have offhand. What are the, I don't have offhand either. Yeah. I know it's not as easily available, uh, free ones, especially for, because mo most people even they use, uh, uh, standard manual way of, I mean, you can use Microsoft Word yeah. as, as well. So, but you've got to know, yeah. manage it well. Um, Dr. Vic, maybe send Nandi Maynard the link to the presentation on um, using MS Word and MS Excel. Yes, yes. We, we, and the other qualitative. Um, it's always difficult because you can get one, uh, two of three things when you use soft, free software or uh, uh, any software. It's either free, easy, or... Um, it's either yeah, it's no cost. It's easy to use, or or you need to have some extra knowledge. It's you never get everything. Yeah, it's not always never. It's never going to be everything. You're always going to be lacking something, or you have no support, or it. I know that I tried to find software for qualitative that was free and easy, and just couldn't. Uh, I will send you the link, Nandy, on uh, the the. Uh session that we held that we organized uh, I think a few weeks back on using Word and Excel for qualitative research analysis I think that will really be helpful so I will send you the link the recording and the presentation file so please run through it uh, if you have further question then you you can write to us all right so thank you so much once again for uh, a great session a great discussion so I do hope uh, you have benefited from this session do not hesitate to contact us uh, if you have uh, uh, any other question. Uh, yes, uh, Leslie, I will send you the link as well. So in fact, what we are trying to do now is uh, trying to put up all our the, the workshops that we have conducted so far into the website. So anyone who have missed it over the past many weeks, they can easily get back because we've been doing this over the last few semesters. So we have uh, a lot of uh, the workshops are already recorded. The presentation file is there. So I think this will be helpful uh, for you as well. So uh, don't forget our next session for this uh, Research Essentials uh, series is going to be on the uh, 27th November, producing highly visible and impactful research. Next week's session, next Friday is going to be our uh, next research edge session so for those of you who are keen to listen to what is coming for this week uh, uh, look out for the flyer that will be coming out so i hope to see you all again uh, on friday so until we meet again thank you so much thank you miss balance uh, for the session today thank you everyone thank you thank you everyone for coming in today and stay safe and have a good weekend bye-bye